invite you to stand and sing with us. We're going to begin with two songs that are from the hymnal. Hymn number 297, Here I Am to Worship, and we're going into His Name is Wonderful. So let's worship together. Good morning and welcome everyone on this Mother's Day. We're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, maybe you're visiting mom or grandma today. Um, it may be that you're a little bit interested in what goes on here, even though you don't come back all the time or this isn't your regular uh, location. You can learn a little bit more about what's going on at our church on a regular basis by just giving us an email address. Um, and we would include you on our constant contact, and you can uh, know what's going on. You can even ask mom or grandma about what it is that, that they're doing as part of that. For those of you who this is your community and you're new to us or just still getting connected, still figuring out if 
you want to get more connected to us, we, we would love you to give even more information um, that we could follow up with you and just make you feel more welcome, feel a part. Um, for some of us, we might have prayer requests. We might have, um, we might have decisions we want to consider. There may be a way that you have more information that you want to communicate. Just know that these are in the pew racks in front of you. And in a minute when we have our opportunity to have an offering time and connection time while we're moving around, you can move to the boxes at the back or you can um, move to the plates right here and leave that in the same way that you would leave an offering. Um, and we would love to be able to follow up with you. Today's uh, Mother's Day. And one thing that's really challenging and important to me is to be honest and recognize the complexity of this day. Uh, Paul, in Romans 12, 15, in giving encouragement to how we're supposed to live out this Christian life, says that we should learn how to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And not to, in any way, disparage the rejoicing side, and many of us may be here in a rejoicing kind of way, but to recognize when it comes to Mother's Day, that's not everybody's experience. And so for some of us, Mom was a great experience. Mom's done a great job, and we get to celebrate with her today. For some, we've had great moms, great grandmas, and we grieve them today. For some of us, mom might have done the best she could, but it wasn't something that we think of fondly. For some of us, we can't wait and hope to be a mom or married to a mom, and it hasn't happened yet, and we don't know if it's ever going to happen. For some of us, we never met our birth mom. For some of us, we just know that the task of momming is so overwhelming that we always feel inadequate. And even on this day when we go, thank you, we just keep thinking about all the ways we wish we were doing it better. And so in all of those ways, how can we love one another in this place in a way that lets us rejoice for everybody who's here rejoicing and weep with all of us that are weeping and it be okay that all of us aren't on the same page and all of us don't have the same experience and yet we all have it together. In the back, on your way out, there are some um, flowers uh, that are uh, in the stands that, that are in, in the vases that we encourage you to take. It may be that you're a mom and it would be edifying to you. Maybe you're going to visit a mom and it would be great to give it to them or even to a neighbor who's a mom who you don't think anybody's going to recognize. Maybe it's to take because you're going to go to a gravestone and you want to leave it there. We really want all of those flowers to disappear and be used however best it would be for you to celebrate today, whether you're rejoicing or weeping. Now I'm going to say a word of prayer for all of us in our experience of Mother's Day as well as focusing on moms based on the words that we learned from Jesus last week. And then let's do everything we can in this moment together to rejoice with those who rejoice, to weep with those who weep, and to make this a significant moment regardless of which one. Jesus, you encouraged us to take heart, no matter how dark the night, no matter how frustrating the task, and maybe for many here, motherhood is kind of like being in that boat in the dark and feeling like we're never making enough progress. And it's scary and we're not sure. Will you help us take heart? Will you help us to believe that you, the great I am, is with us and loving us and helping us? Will you help us, therefore, set aside our, all of our fears? Our fears of being good enough, our fears of what our kids will be or what they're going through, our fears of whether we can be good enough kids to the moms that we had or that we have enough forgiveness in our hearts for what didn't go right. And so thank you for meeting us in this place today that we could take heart, that we could trust you, the I am, that we could cast away fear and replace it with love, that you would help us love each other and make this a significant encounter, not only with each other, but with you today, God, as we know that you are with us weeping and rejoicing no matter what we're feeling right now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Welcome for this time of the offertory and connection. This is a time to practice giving and receiving. Okay? Sometimes it's easy to give, it's easy to give, but it can be hard to receive. I love you and I need your love. Especially today, Mother's Day, this is a special time where we get to go around and just acknowledge each other and be grateful to be in his presence in this beautiful building together where we get to celebrate this wonderful day. Okay. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this very, very special day set aside for us to all take a moment to consider all of those wonderful women in our lives, whether they're our real mother or mother-like figures, God. Thank you for these people who show their love and give unconditionally. Help us during this time of connection and offertory. Be with us and help us be willing to receive the love from other people. Amen. The offering plates are here and in the back. You're welcome to stand up and share a smile. As you're making your way back to your places, sing with us step by step. Today we get a little bit of an opportunity to discuss uh, what Jesus teaches that's very difficult and challenging and wonderful that relates to our celebration of this sacrament or ritual or uh, practice or whatever word you might use for this exchanging of the bread and the cup. And um, I think an easy way to kind of consider where you might be coming from 
is whether you're more inclined to call this experience communion or whether you're more inclined to call it Lord's Supper. And for many who are raised with the idea of Lord's Supper, that this is the Lord's Supper, it's connected to the idea of the Last Supper, that last meal that Jesus had with the Twelve, with his disciples. And that's because when we look at the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them, when they tell that story of that last night before everything's going to go terribly bad, They tell the story of Jesus at the table and make a significant connection to this idea of this is bread and it's my body and this is the cup of my blood and take and eat and take and drink. And so we have that idea, but we can lose something if that's all we've ever understood about this because that's not how the Gospel of John tells it. As we've been moving through the John, and as I encouraged you a couple of weeks ago and continue to encourage you to read chapters 13 to 17 there, as that tells the story, the most significant event in John's retelling of that moment is Jesus washing feet of his disciples and then teaching them in chapters 14, 15, and 16 a bunch of things that will relate to even some of the things we talk about today and then praying for him in chapter 17. And he doesn't even talk about the event in that way, but it's partly because he already has. See, in John chapter 6, he's telling the story of Jesus introducing this a year or more, this teaching, this idea about Jesus as the bread, about eating his body and drinking his blood. This teaching in John chapter 6 comes in the middle of Jesus' ministry. And that's important because it is not just for us to have a remembrance of that last night. It is because Jesus is teaching something in the midst of that that is about an every single day way to live. And that the challenge of living in Jesus' way and truth and life, the challenge in living Jesus' way of love, not fear, needs some fuel. And so in John chapter 6, it's awesome because we were just studying this. John 6 starts with the feeding of the 5,000, then goes to Jesus walking on water, and he doesn't even include that Peter does that. And then it begins this story in verse 22 of chapter 6 and goes all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 71. We're not going to read all those verses today. I'm going to give you some portion of that, but I want to encourage you. Please, read those verses and all the interesting things that are in it, including what we talk about briefly for, for just a minute here. And I would love to discuss that with anybody as you investigate some of those things. But there, they have this moment where this challenging teaching comes out that we're going to touch on for just a minute. So challenging that if you have a hard time today, just know you're in good company. Because in chapter 6, verse 60, 60, I'm sorry, verse 60, it says, when many of his disciples, and that's not just the 12, that's all these people who are following, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult, who can accept it? And not just that, they didn't accept it. Because verse 66 said, because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. But when Jesus introduces this, there's a, there's a shock and awe. There's a thinning of the crowd. And so what could be so challenging? What, what could be something that we're more inclined to, as we've been describing, just keep our box our box and kind of ignore it. Just keep our box and fix it so that it fits in there instead of being stretched. Well, beginning in verse 22, it says that that next morning when they woke up, after the feeding of the 5,000, after Jesus had sent the disciples across the water, after Jesus had gone up on the mountain and then met them in the middle of the night, then they got across the water. That next morning, that crew that had been fed, they recognized that the disciples were gone because they kind of saw them leave. But Jesus didn't go with them, but we don't find Jesus anywhere, so let's go find everybody. And they head off to find him. And when they find him, Jesus says... I don't think you're really looking for me because you saw a sign that would change what you think about God. I think you had your tummies filled and you want some more food. And it sets the stage of this bread being part of a conversation 
where Jesus is challenging them and they're wondering, well, well, who are you and what are you doing and how did you do this and what about bread? And remember from when we were studying it before, this is the time of the Passover, the way John tells the story. And so the idea of Moses as a leader who had something to do with some bread that got fed in the middle of a wilderness. And so they ask questions about manna. What about Moses giving manna? Are you going to do that? Is that a sign you can do, Jesus? And Jesus corrects them and says, no, Moses didn't give you manna. God gave you manna. And at the end of this story, he also even comes back and says, and people ate manna and died. So it's not that that wasn't a bread from heaven and it wasn't that God wasn't involved, but that's not what I'm talking about. And so what was he talking about? Jump with me to verse 33. It says, Jesus speaking here, for the bread of God. Now, so not just bread of some kind, not just the bread you guys ate yesterday, not just the manna that you've read about, but somehow a true bread, somehow a bread of God. The bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world, to anybody who wants it, everybody who wants it. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And then Jesus responds. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And for some of us, especially if we were readers of John's gospel, we'd clue right in because, oh, thirsty. Because two chapters back, remember, he met a woman at a well and said, you shouldn't be asking me. You should be asking me for the water because I have a water that if you drink, you'll never be thirsty. And then that thirst will not only not happen, it'll be a flowing fountain inside of you that there's something more going on, that God is providing some kind of food, some kind of drink that's about some kind of life that isn't just after you die, that's the way you're going to live this life more abundantly right now, a life not engineered by fear, but engineered by Love, saturated with such love. And Jesus is making the claim, now I'm that bread. It's not that I can give you bread. I'm the bread. And as we looked at before, I am that name, Yahweh of God, that comes up in Exodus, the celebration of the Passover reminding us of Exodus. I am Jesus standing in that place that I haven't just come from heaven. I am the physical representative. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. Here I am. I'm the bread. And yet, that's already a little bit too much for them. Their first question and concern, we see it in verse 42. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, like we know his grandparents, how can he now say, I've come down from heaven? You haven't come down from heaven. You've come from around the street. You've come from around the corner, dude. We know your mama and dad. What are you claiming you've come from? Like, we appreciate the food and all, but what are you talking about? And what do you mean your bread? But Jesus doubles down in such a cool way that he's going to blow their minds, right? He's going to make it hard to believe. Skip ahead to verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Whoa. Now you're going crazy town on us. Your flesh? That can't be. There are laws against us eating each other. This is what the pagans do, not what we do. This can't be true. As a matter of fact, it's not practical. Even if you could somehow, like, somehow it was you, like there's only you, one dude, how are you feeding all of us without running out of body? And yet Jesus doesn't stop there. Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? In verse 53, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Yeah, no wonder this is a hard teaching. No wonder people will walk away. This is just a lot. What could he possibly mean? How could it possibly be? And yet there's this sense in which Jesus is saying, no, 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 I'm telling you what's really real. 
I'm telling you what's really essential. I'm telling you about me. I have come. I have been sent and I have come and I am really flesh and I am really blood. I'm as real as anything else you could have. And that there's somehow an eating on it. And it's interesting, this word, this word for eating here is a word for crunch, for gnaw, for chew. Like, you need to gnaw on me. You need to chew on me. You need to get everything out of me because that's the only way to walk in this life that, again, careful, isn't just about some kind of life after death. Is life eternal, meaning the life that is full of life, the abundant life that he's going to talk about in chapter 10. That somehow, if you want to live the life that Jesus is inviting you to live, this kingdom life that's based on love, so much love that you could love your enemies, so much that you could die on behalf of not only friends, but those who hate you, those who see all of us as mattering, not just some of us, not a group who's just coming up with who's on the right side or the wrong side of the line, but one who's going to be willing to say all of us are made in the image of God and loved and therefore worth sacrificing for because to love you is to love God. To live that kind of life, you need nourishment. To live that kind of life, you need change and transformation. To live that kind of life, you need something more than yourself. And I'm telling you that it's me. And I'm telling you, you don't just need to believe ideas about me. You don't need to just agree that I did something miraculous. You need to actually take me somehow and put me inside of you in a way that it no longer separates between me and you. You and I are one. And so he says it in this way. Look, verse 56. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me. For some of us, those whistles go off and go, oh, vine and branches. Abide in me and I abide in you and you can bear much fruit. I'm in you and you're in me and the flow, it all flows through and that's the only way that there's actually going to be growth and there's only going to be fruit. Abide. This eating and this drinking is somehow about abiding and not only abiding, keep going. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. It's about intimacy, and it's about oneness. I'm not going to get graphic, but just we think about on this day what it means for a mama and a baby to be one while eating. That where you begin and where I begin are exchanged, and my fuel comes from inside of you. And if I don't gnaw on you, mama, I don't get the nourishment that I need. Jesus is giving us this picture that for you to actually live the transformed life, there is a need for you in real life, in real things, to be so nourished by him that you then can, in the way that Paul talks about, no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Because the life I now live in the flesh, in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God that the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father and the Father and the Son are in us and we are in the Father and the Son. And as a result of that, we are different and we're being transformed and we can live. And then he says, this, it's as real as taking bread into your mouth that you can gnaw on and feel and taste, touch That when it is gnawed on, it comes into you and it becomes part of you and it flows through you and it comes out of you in energy. That my body and my blood need to be gnawed on, sipped on, taken in until you are so saturated because otherwise, how in the world are you going to live this transformed, different life totally controlled by fears? And unfortunately for church history, some have turned this event even right back to those fears and right back to who's clean and who's unclean and who can participate and who can't and how you're supposed to see it and not see it and let's argue about it. And Jesus is going like, I'm going to tell you in such a way that it's hard for you to buy and you may want to walk away, but here's the deal. Eat me or you don't understand what we're up to here. And it's not just eat me in some kind of ceremonial event. That this moment that we get to have together in just a second is about reminding us that it's about every single meal, every single bread, every single juice, every single water, every single is a part of the creator 
whose thumbprint all over it, will you take in from me and saturate with me the gracious love that is Jesus in the Father, in the Spirit, in the Son, all is one in you and you in him, and it make it as real as it could be so that you could live it today. Way back in the early 200s, Augustine said, in essence, the way we would put it today, the way our mamas would say it, you are what you eat. You become what you eat. And if you will gnaw on the way and truth and life, the physical realness of all that Jesus is and does, if you will gnaw on it, you will become like him. And if you refuse to gnaw on it, you're missing of what he's asking you and inviting you to become. That's already possible, not because you can do it yourself, but because this is the offer. A water so that thirst changes to a flowing fountain. A meal so that you are nourished from the inside out. You and the Father are one. Vine, branches, fruit, life. And so what I want to encourage us to do, however you're ready for it, because again, it's a hard teaching. Some of you may already like, I'm just looking to walk away. Granted. But in just a minute, you're going to be invited for any of you, all of you, anyone who wants to come to take this moment of being able to take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup and taste something and feel something and wonder then, what does it mean for how I eat of Jesus? How is it that I take it inside my soul, inside my body, in my real life? Not just an idea land, but how I am going to live here and now in real flesh and blood. And how it fuels me. And how this celebration of a meal changes how I think about every single meal. And every person who touches every piece of food all along the path before I get to eat it. And every place in the world where it is grown and what life is like there. And who waited on me to deliver it just because I had some money. And how it affects how I see the creation and the people and all things. Because I am eating that I might become like what I'm eating. Last thing, which is on the other side. Some of us need to challenge ourselves with how we're being nourished or not so nourished by other things. If you are what you eat, then you also are what you eat when what you eat is fear, when what you eat is domination, when what you eat is victimhood, when what you eat is us against them, when what you eat is identify and destroy enemies, not love your enemies. For some of us, we wake up every morning and turn on the water of a screen and play it in the background all day long and it has nothing to do with Jesus way truth in life and it is like eating chips and then trying to have dinner I don't care what your channel is I don't care what your person is don't care I'm asking you to care are there things that I am so feasting on that it is filling me up in such a way that I'm becoming more like that I'm becoming more fearful, more hateful, more winning so that you lose, more unwilling to sacrifice because why would I sacrifice for you? You'll just hurt me. For some of us, it's not just what we are willing to eat and how we think about how we do that with Jesus. It's about stopping the flow of the other things we eat at the level that we eat them because they're getting in the way of us becoming like Jesus. And so however he speaks to you, I don't know your deals. But as we look at this meal, what would it be for me to choose to eat differently because I'm trying to transform into a way of life that's only possible if it comes from the inside out? In just a second, I'm going to um, ask Jerry to, to play a song. And as he plays the song, I'm going to ask you to reflect on what is going on for you today, whether it has whether, whether something to do with what I was doing or not. But 
when he does that, well, then the deacons are going to come, and we're going to set up these stations. And then after the song's over, I'm going to invite you to come, and you're welcome to come, all of you, whether you're first time here, last time here, whatever. And so we will set those up, and I'll give you a little bit of direction. But during the song, as we set those things up, I ask you, don't miss this moment to listen to the voice of God, to wonder about this hard teaching and what you might do with it, of this experience that stands before us, so that at the end of the song, when we get a chance to come forward, you have this moment to really make the most of it. All right, Jerry? After I pray, I'm going to invite you to come. And when I do, uh, these two sections, if you will start at the front, and those of you who would like to participate, nobody's forced to participate. That's perfectly fine. But if you'll come here and come down the aisles, meet on each side, and then just return. On the outside, if you will come this way to this, come here and return back that way. Same thing on that side, and return out that way. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and then you're invited to come and participate however you would like. God, thank you that we have this chance to somehow act on 
eating the bread that is your body, eating the drinking of the cup that is your blood, of what it means to just say we want to be nourished by you in this moment of communion, union, being one with you in this unique way to fuel us in a way so that we might live out that love. Will you use this experience and help us to meet you in it? In Jesus' name, amen. Um, the one thing, if you haven't done it here before, we really encourage you that when you take a piece, they will, you, they will offer you the bread. With, you'll tear off a big enough piece that not only can you gnaw on it, that's the point, right? But that it's big enough that when you dip it in the juice, you don't have to get your fingers in the juice, okay? Just for all of our sake, please. Um, and so, so please, just big enough that you'll take a piece, dip it, and then continue on. If you will now, stand as it is your turn, and please come.
we have one group that's finishing up top, helping uh, reach our audiovisual people, and so we appreciate them. We want them to be included. Okay, y'all are done. Okay, okay. Um, I want to say a word of prayer um, over this time, God. As we started before, help us take heart. Let this experience be one that helps us take heart, have the nourishment, the courage, the forgiveness, the joy, the fuel that we need to walk in your ways, to believe that somehow you could be in us and with us and use us, that you, the great I am, are not just I am the bread, you're the I am everything to us, and help us as we think now about our week ahead, every meal, every moment, how we might do it a little differently, how we might eat and drink on you, gnaw on you in such a way that we live differently. And whatever it might mean, God, for us to some of us change our taste buds, to somehow want to consume more of you and less of whatever those other things that seem to feel make us safe or make us successful but oftentimes just make us scared. Thank you for this Mother's Day and in the great meal we get to share with moms and grandmas ahead, help it to be full of your love, casting out fear. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll give Jerry your attention. Thank you, Jay. What a great time of worship. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this experience this morning. Um, thank you, Jay. Thank you for a, a beautiful service and what you have brought to it. And it's a good time to announce that Jay will be continuing as our teaching pastor through the end of the summer. So we're glad that you're going to be here with us, Jay. We appreciate what the Lord is doing through you. Okay, don't stop clapping, because next Sunday we're having five baptisms. <laughs> yes. Um, we know the Lord is working here, and we're so glad to be part of that. And also, while you're clapping, okay. <laughs> okay. We may meet, beat the Methodist after all. Okay, here, um, <laughs> there are baby bottles to collect for, um, for the Pregnancy and Family Life Center in the Sun Tzu classes. They are available also in the office if you want to drop by and pick those up. Thank you for Shell and all that she's doing with that and other people involved in that. The library repurposing project is in full swing. Go get a book. If you didn't get anything for your mom, go get a book, wrap it up. Um, Make sure it's a book that would be appropriate for giving your mom. Uh, but next Saturday, or this Saturday, May 18th, we're going to have a, a... Okay, I'll give you pizza if you'll come and help get the library cleaned out in the next part. It, from 10.30 to 12 is when we're going to have a work day uh, that Brandy will be leading, and she's ready to provide the pizza, so you can come for that. Now, one more thing. This Wednesday night... At 6 o'clock and at 7 o'clock, we're having our preschool graduation. Carly does a great job with that, and I want us to make sure that if you can be here to support that, to greet people, to tell them we're glad that they're part of this program, to celebrate with them as their little ones are going through this graduation time. 6 o'clock is one, 7 o'clock is the other one. So those are some things happening, other things happening, if you'll you notice on the the screen and other announcements that are listed. Thank you for being with us this morning. Let's stand and sing as we leave.